Coming up, I dedicate this entire episode to the rear floor pan. I had an original, but it was really rough, and I had to preserve some of the pieces, and then I had to make some of the other pieces to restore this pan. I'm gonna dive deeper into the Polmax machine and the power hammer and show you how I use these machines to make what I needed to make. And I wanna thank all of you for watching these videos. Thank you for liking, subscribing, and making comments. That all is tremendous in us getting some more views and what that means as an editor. I got a lot of great cars in the can filmed. I just need to get them edited out to you. So thanks for watching. It's really helping. and We'll get those out to you really soon. Hello, I'm Mark Clayton. I've had the pleasure of owning, restoring, and driving these magnificent classic cars for over 40 years now. Take a ride along with me as I embark on the adventure of acquiring and restoring these great cars. You know, I hate to admit it, but sometimes I gotta admit defeat. And this is one of those instances. This is the rear pan for the, the Project Model A. And this pan was shared by the convertible sedan, the A400, the Deluxe Phaeton and the Victoria. And this really marked a first in a certain sense is that they, they got rid of the flat floor in the back. They could scrunch up the body a little bit more by dropping the, the passenger's feet down. And if you did not have this drop pan in Victoria, the person in the back would have no leg room at all. It's really tight back there. But it really was a first of a design feature to come. Well, amongst many of the Victoria with the no visor above the windshield, a slanted windshield, the bustle back in the back, canting the rear spare tire forward, they were really trying out a lot of new things. And it is a great idea. Our particular pan was just beat to hell like the rest of the car. So the front, which is made out of about 18 gauge, it's a little bit heavier, it worked beautifully. I, I would imagine that this metal is an extra deep draw because they've got to draw all the way around here and then up and over. There's a lot of pulling to make this piece and it worked really well. When we have extra deep draw metal, we can go in there with normal body techniques of hammer and dolly and we can get them straightened up. And this thing straightened up really nice. The thing I wanted to preserve is that we want our car to look new. We don't want it to look restored. So we don't want to put any Bondo on here and a lot of primer and all that kind of thing. I still want to see the stretch marks where when they stamped this piece, it pulled it in. I want to see all those little things from when they made the part when we're done. So straightening it all out and I'll say essentially metal finishing it, that will give our goal of having it look new, not restored. Our problem comes in back here in the back. This is the section that sits underneath the rear cushion and it was just absolutely beat to hell. I sort of straightened it up so I could figure out what I had going here and I realized that you just simply can't make this pan look new again. So what I'm gonna do is make a new one. Well, we have several challenges here. The first of which is this rib that's running through here. Now that's not the end of the world. It's pretty easy if you have a Pomax machine and it takes three dies. This die here is gonna be the bottom side that goes right in here. This die here is what's gonna be used on the straight. And I can get away with one die in the top. Now this guy will go down there and just form the very end right there. But in the middle section, it can just go on through uh, and the metal will feed with these relieved spots. And it'll all go right up to the end, right up to the end. Then I'll have to switch the die to the end, the round die, and then we'll just stamp the end. I also have a hand die. And what that'll help me do is, you know, just touch up these corners a little bit. And also I have the round for here, in case I gotta do a little bit of hand work just touching it up. But what we're gonna do before we run this through the Pomax machine is we're gonna run it through the power hammer with the linear stretching die. And we're gonna give this metal a little bit of hump to it, a stretch that metal out so that when we put this rib in here, it won't disturb the metal on each side quite so bad. Another challenge that we've got is these ribs on each side. Now I could make a die for that. We could stretch the heck out of this. We could go to the press and just press that in there. But that's a lot of work to make a die that big to stamp that in there. I think in this case, because these are in really pretty good shape, 
We're just going to cut this out. We're going to hammer weld that back into our new panel and be done with it. The other thing I've got to do, obviously, is cut out this section here. This is where the rear cross member protrudes up through. There's a piece of fabric that goes over here with some pieces of metal that screwed that down. And I've got a little lip that turns down here. And we'll use the Pomax machine to do that. You could make this lip in a lot of different ways. You could do it with a claw hammer and a rock. You could do it with a tipping wheel. You could do it with a hammer and dolly if you were good enough holding your dolly in the right spot. But for us, I think the Pomax machine with a die, once again, to roll that over will work best for us. And then the final thing I've got to keep in mind of is these right here are the hinges for the backrest. There's a little latch up here, this little spring-loaded thing. You pull the seat forward, and there's enough room back there for, say, a small cookbook or maybe your favorite oil painting. But anyways, there's a little bit of room back here. This has got to fold forward. So we have to have our rear seat backrest in the right spot. So we'll make sure that we locate these in the right spot. We've run some preliminary tests without the linear stretching die just to make sure that our dies were the right size. Here's our straight through. Ran this in here several times. I was playing here with the sides and the, and the distance between the two dies. And then here is the, our our test for the end and I think it's going to work just absolutely perfectly but what we need to do next is we need to go stretch a panel and then run it through the Polmax machine and see how smooth our metal is on each side. So without further ado let's make some noise. Well here is our our divider that goes in the pan that goes underneath the seats on the Model A. What I've done is I've transferred the pattern from the original to this one I've trimmed out all the little pieces with just normal tin snips and I've filed the corners a little bit to make them nice and sharp. What's going to happen here is we're going to put this in this box and pan break and we're going to break these up here and then that's what gets spot welded to our pan. Well, what's going to happen is we're going to end up bending this little corner right here. It's no big deal. We'll just go to the power hammer and we'll straighten that out. This is an easy one. Now I've set up the brake so that it gives a little bit of a soft bend. It wasn't a super, super sharp bend on the original. So I've set this up to duplicate that bend. It looks pretty good, but what I'll have to do here is I'll have to tweak it just a little bit and make sure I get this at a 90. Sometimes you got to play with this a little bit. It seems like you're at 90 in the break, but actually you've gone over. You're like 95 to 100, so I kind of inch up on it. And that looks real good. Two more pins to go and this will be ready to put in. And because these little corners right down here are going to hit this blade, this is called a box and pan break for a reason, is that you can bend something into a box or a pan by removing these to clear this, then you'll be able to make your bend and not harm this. So let's remove a couple of these and we'll be able to continue the bend. Now if I go ahead and pull the fingers out first and then make the bend, my little ends that aren't caught here with a finger are not going to be nice and sharp. Whereas if I make at least half the bend now, then pull the fingers out, then finish the bend, 
I'll have a real nice line all the way across. Once again, I don't want to go too far, and this turned out just absolutely perfect. Let's see how it fits. That's going to be lovely. Well, the idea behind this handy little tool is it's a snap punch. And boy, is it handy to just go along and snap punch this and I'll show you why in just a second. And this is called a Whitney Punch. They make these new today. They're made in America. They're absolutely wonderful handy things. Better off to punch a hole in the metal than you are to drill a hole because you have a nice round hole. And uh, these work real well up to quarter inch in about uh, 20 gauge, 18 gauge, They're right in there. Works really nice. And if you saw any of my other videos, when I try to make a spot weld without being able to spot weld it, my spot welder won't reach down this deep and this far into the panel. What I do is I just punch the holes in the one piece and then I plug weld it up with the MIG welder, grind it off, and it looks absolutely beautiful. And if it doesn't have quite enough of a dimple in it, we just take a punch, make a dimple in it. Well, since we got to make this new panel for the back end here, I got to cut this thing off of here. And the best way to do this, I found, is I just take a wheel cutter and I cut all the spot welds. And then I just start working the panel back and forth. If I got to cut a little bit more, I do it. But I just work it right off of there. And then what little bit has remained left on there, I clean it off. There's rust in between the two panels anyway. So grind it off and there it is. I looked everywhere for weeks to find these snaps. They're just not available. But I came up with a solution to the problem and here's what I did. I took a 532nd tubular rivet. I had to turn the head down well, about 20 thousandths so that it would fit inside my snap. And here is the snap that's exactly like the original. So I just simply inserted my rivet down into the snap. And voila, look at that. And then when I get done riveting it in the pan, I drilled a hole up through the middle just in case the judges got their flashlight out. Well, I gotta get the center cut out of this thing and I think the easiest way for me to do it is to go over to my hole punch, punch some holes at each end, 
and then I can use my electric nibbler and uh, cut it right out. You know, there's a lot of ways that you can get from New York to LA. There's a scenic way, the fastest way, there's a lot of highways. Well, it's kind of the same thing by making these panels. In this panel, surprisingly, the easy part is this bead right here. This bead, I got a uh, die in the Polmax machine and I can knock it out pretty fast. That's the easy part. The other part that it wouldn't be too bad, either highway that you want to take, is this part here for the clearance of the rear bumper bar. I've chose the highway of cutting this out and laying it in our new panel. But you could make a die of that and just beat it out and put it right in your panel. It's just which way do you want to go. Surprisingly, the challenge part is this, the hole here in the middle. This part, I could make it three or four or five different ways. The first thing I did is I went over to the Polmax machine and put a die in there that rolls this over. And here it is here. Well, this one corner worked out rather well. This other corner here didn't work out well at all. So I decided it was just a little bit too hard to control in that machine. So I rejected that method. The second method that I could do it is in a rolling and beating machine. And we have a couple of them here with different dies. And I tried this panel here in the one rolling and beating machine. And it's, as you can see, it worked quite well. The challenge is, is keeping this line here all nice and straight. So I'm kind of rejecting that methodology. The third methodology is the old-fashioned way. You make a die and you beat it over it, kind of like a claw hammer and a rock. And that's what I made these for. I made one for the top and one for the bottom. I'm going to clamp the metal in the middle and I'm just going to beat it over a hammer like we used to do many moons ago before we had all these cool machines. Notice how I just take a bunch of small blows. I'm not trying to move it down in one shot. Just slowly move the metal over the edge and it'll be much smoother and a lot less work later on getting it straight. Okay, it looks real good. My lip is a hair long and we can grind that off. I didn't want to make it too short. Same thing on the other side and we'll be done. Well, so after you get the long section all bent over, guess what? Stretch the metal. See, it's not straight. So the weapon of choice here is the Urco Shrinker. I can shrink this edge just slightly. Doesn't take much and I can straighten that panel out absolutely perfect. And see now how it just lays nice and flat on the bench. Looks turned down beautiful, square, straight. Looks factory to me. Well now to our linear stretching die on our power hammer. But before I do that, I want to tell you about this hammer a little bit. I had a friend who was scrapping out six road graders. And I was looking at it and I saw that the part that goes over the blade and up to the front wheels was just a perfect backbone to a power hammer. And that's what this is right here. What I did is I cut that up and I used the base of the platform where somebody sat to use it the base here. Then I took some of the E-ropes cabs or the part that goes up and over the driver and I cut them up and used these arms here. 
and I was running it off of a friction fan belt system and it was kind of a crazy setup and it didn't work very well. When I had Steve Powell make this big hammer for me, he offered to fix this hammer the way it really should be. And what he did is he put a new base and gusseted the base. He put gussets on both the bottom here and the top and he really beefed it up. Then I brought it home and changed the system to an electronic system, which really is the best way to go. And here's how it works. We run a three phase, two horsepower motor on top, but we run it on single phase power through a variable frequency drive. And then we control the VFD through a potentiometer pedal right off of a TIG welder. And it works beautifully. Whenever we do power hammer work, we're just speeding up and making easier what we do with a hammer and a dolly. It just goes a lot faster if we can hit exactly where we want to hit, how hard we want to hit it, and how often we want to hit it. And that's all a power hammer does for us. The important thing is control. And what this hammer does is has precise control. I can hit one light hit, one heavier hit, a bunch of heavy hits, or a bunch of little light hits. I can do anything in between. So this hammer really has kind of become my favorite. Not that Steve didn't build a great hammer, he did. I just think that the cone clutch setup that was originally on the Yoder power hammers was old. And I just don't think it's as controllable as this. So someday, I'm gonna change that thing over to this setup. This here is a linear stretching die. And what this is gonna do is stretch the metal right where I'm gonna go ahead and put the bead in it. And then that way, it won't deform the metal on each side of that bead as bad. So a little pre-stretching, we'll make it nice and flat. Of course, whenever we stretch the metal, what we're doing is we're making it thinner, but it grows bigger. Metal will form along slip plates, and all we're really doing is taking metal, and when we shrink it, we bring those slip plates together, and when we stretch it, we push them apart. It's going to make the metal thicker when we shrink it, it's going to make the metal thinner when we stretch it. Well, here's our setup in the Polmax machine. This is the best way to make these beads. We already made our dies, so we're all set there, and then we've installed a fence in the back here to keep it nice and straight. Now remember, we have blind ends, so we can't go on and off the panel. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start kinda here at one end of the panel, and I'm gonna work my way all the way down to the other end of the panel, and leaving about an inch on each end. And then we can take care of that with the rounding die at the end. And I'm also going to take care of these other lines, everything with this die set up as it is. And then what we've done here, we've installed a fence so we can keep everything nice and straight. Should go pretty good. Let's see. <laughs>
Well, I got a few more steps in this pan before I can call it done. And the next one I need to do is this step. The original pan had a 3 8 step in it, and of course I got to reproduce the same. And it just so happens 10 Smith will bend a 3 8 step. That's the minimum bend it'll do. It just worked out perfect for me. Well, it's back to the Whitney punch, and once again, I'm going to spot weld this using my MIG welder. Just plug weld up those holes, and off we go. My spot welder has only got one foot long arms. They never make it. So now i got to mark out those relief bumps in the pan for the rear bumper. And uh, remember, we could make these new if we just made a die or a buck and we formed it over, or cut these out. In this case, I think it's faster and better, just cut these out, and uh, the tool of choice was the air saw. The same old cut and fit, and then back to the hammer welding it in place. And if you do this right, you don't have to do any lead work, no bondo, no finish work. Take your time, line up the panels, hammer weld each and every spot, and you can just dress it off and voila, you're done.
And now it's back to the Whitney punch because we need holes for the nails to go all the way along the backside. So one of the last things I've got to do to this pin before I marry the two together is I've got to get these uh, rear hinges for the backrest in place. And these are the brackets on the end and east side, so I'm kind of simulating a spot weld here. Well, better late than never, and under the category of things don't always go right, I am finally ready to put our pan to our foot pan. What happened was, is yesterday when I was doing these beads in the Polmax machine, I didn't get the bottom collet tight enough, and that die was shifting around, and it made itself a perfect shear, and it ended up cutting a line all the way down in the pan. So I just used the pan as a test thing and I got the, the lower die nice and tight and it worked out fine. But it put me behind a couple hours because I had to make a pan again with this hole in it and roll this edge over like we did on the first pan. So better late than never, here we are. We do have our original hump pieces here for the rear bumper brackets welded in place. We have our seat backrest hinges in place. I couldn't find an exact hinge and I was missing this piece right here. So I just went ahead and made it. And those are all spot welded in and ready to go. What I've got going here is I have the sub rails all square and straight and level on the frame. And I have the foot pan sitting in here square and straight also. So I just want to make sure that when I do our seat pan to the floor pan that it is also square and straight. And one other thing is I want to make sure that this hump here for the rear spring is right in the middle of my opening. So I'm just going to tack this in a couple of places. Then I'm going to move over to the bench and finish it off. The reason why I'm going to do that is this edge right here has got a little bit of a roll to it. And I couldn't do that in the break, but I can form that as I'm spot welding it on down. So we'll be over at the bench to finish this thing up. I'm just going to hold this down in position and give it a quick tack weld. And one on the other side should do it. Well, under the category of things don't always go right, this rear pan ended up being a lot more work than I thought. It was a day project, but it ended up taking me about a day and a half. We have it finally fastened to the floor pan and that all set in here and square and straight. I'm not gonna mount it right now. I need to take it out, do a little bit of finished body work to it, prime it, make sure that it's all good, paint it black, then we'll mount this in here once that the body is all done. Because remember, our wood sills have to be a sort of semi-gloss to flat black wood preservative. So we can't fasten this in just at this time. I like to build cars from the bottom up. 
I like to know that my frame is perfectly straight, my running board brackets are right, everything is right. I've had the front fenders on this, made sure everything was good. And then I mount my sub rails to the frame. I put two pads underneath each body bolt hole because I want to give myself adjustment later on. If I just use one pad and I need to get rid of a pad, well then I wouldn't have anything underneath there. So that's, uh, that's the way I like to do that. Then on the uh, cross sills and all that, I don't have these things final screwed together yet because the next operation I want to do is I want to bring the whole tub section in here, the whole back of the body, and fit it in here and make sure it's right. I've measured it up and it looks good, but I want to make sure that all is right. And then I'll start fitting all the internal wood and make sure it's right. Then I'll take the back tub section back off, final uh, glue and screw all the wood together and then bring all that back together once all of the wood and everything has had their uh, black wood preservative applied. So I'm glad this thing's over. It was a little bit more difficult than I imagined.